It was inevitable that as we sailed southeast of Wolverton and over the canal network's newest aqueduct of Grafton Way, we would enter the behemoth that is... This very unique place, you could say for the wrong reasons, depending on who you ask, was either a utopian showcase of modern visionary town planning, the most ambitious new town we built in the country, or just a bit of a crap hole. So to everyone British, I'm pretty sure you know about Milton Keynes, not just that it exists, but... The roundabouts, the endless highways, the concrete, the underpasses, the redways. For the foreign of you, it's basically famous for being this ginormous, visionary post-World War II town planning experiment, but as a result has just become a parody of that style of New Age town planning. Growing up in Britain, I was very used to towns and cities being a mix of old and new, but what was usually the case is an old town centre with newer surroundings. And very eccentric, odd ten-year-old me was a massive fan of street maps. I still am a bit to this day, but when I was ten, I had one of most counties across the UK, in particular Buckinghamshire. And this is when I first found out about Milton Keynes and its grid roads, and I was obsessed. I even designed a town with this exact same method called Martian Keynes to... I guess prepare for human colonisation of Mars? But why build Milton Keynes in the first place? For that, we have to go back to World War II. The German Luftwaffe were bombing many UK cities, especially port cities. To poop. And to fix this, the um, post-war whatever party, I think it was Labour with Attlee, but yeah, them. They wanted to do away with the still standing slums in big city centres because crime conditions, soot, rats, and stinky loos equal health hazards. Enter the New Towns Act. The government commissioned, along with reconstructing said former slums to be as tall as possible, for around 30 new towns to be built across the country, such as Bracknell, Stevenage, and Basildon in the home counties, Cumbernauld and Livingston in the central belt, Telford west of Wolverhampton, Washington near Newcastle, Skelmersdale in South Lancashire. Look, there were dozens of them all across the country, and once they were all built, the government decided that there would be one last one. But this weren't going to be like the others. But now we'd entered the 60s. Everyone was into consumerism and cars. Beeching was committing treason across the country. But North East Buckinghamshire was still empty fields. But not for long. The flat plains of the Ouse Valley between the already established towns of Wolverton, Newport Pagnell and Bletchley were decided as the location of our next new city. In this magical space where the first century constructed Watling Street, 18th century Grand Junction turned Union Canal, 19th century West Coast Main Line, and 20th century M1 all ran parallel. Somewhere like nowhere else was to be built. This was to be the project of Lord John Campbell, sugar plantation heir turned workers' rights advocate, who the main park in the city is named after. He was tasked with not only designing the last, but the biggest and the boldest new town of the lot and would try and implement garden city techniques devised 50 years ago a sort of city in the trees if you will the original plan set up by fred pooley involved multiple self-contained neighborhoods along a monorail and this loop connected to the city center that was to be based at a train station but alas they ditched that plan to build the aforementioned grid network instead with a neighbourhood inside each square. The effect of this is that wherever in the city you stand outside, you can hear the highway. 
But one clever trick they implemented was instead of all the squares being exactly one kilometre by one kilometre, the grid roads flow with the contours of the land so that they are as flat as possible, giving us some wacky oblongs on the map instead of pretty exact squares. One of the main rules in the master plan for Milton Keynes was that no building would be higher than three storeys as to not be higher than most trees. And then there was what Milton Keynes is most famous for. Paralleling the highways were not only lots of trees, but the redways. Fully segregated cycleways to make cycling and driving quicker and safer for everyone. And these weren't just along highways. Old country lanes that didn't fit within the grid network even became redways. Even a closed railway got turned into one. And then eventually the old railway line goes under the, in terms of it, newer M1. On which one side there's a bunch of crappy graffiti, but on this side, someone spray printed a mega mog story. As with any rail line, new, old, or ripped up, you eventually reach a station. This one here is Great Linford, and despite the tracks having long gone, platform's still here. And while you are much safer using them, the sound of traffic and endless going under and over roundabouts is ever present. And for some, they're completely oblivious to their existence. <laughs> Until it suddenly clicks. And the redways weren't the only transport innovation in Milton Keynes. It was the first place in the country to use Dial-A-Ride. Starting in the 70s, each bus stop would have a phone, which you would use to phone, I presume, the bus station, who would then alert a driver nearby to drive by and pick you up. But as the town got bigger, it became viable to run regular bus services going along the grid roads. But how do you get people and businesses to move to a place not only far away from where they already have their established lives, but looks so alien? Good advertising. The commission created many posters and adverts to encourage people to ditch overcrowded neighbourhoods in London and Birmingham for the spacious MK instead. One of the last things to be constructed in the new town was oddly the centre itself. They started by constructing neighbourhoods nearest Bletchley in the south and Wolverton in the north so that new residents could use their pre-existing services and from there they slowly made it to the middle where there would be CMK. Since this centre was a complete clean state, it was designed to have very few dwellings and just be filled with amenities, shopping, entertainment, dreaded, endless car parks. The most hideous building there is this pyramid thing called The Point. And then there's the more center MK. As I'm sure many of you from Britain will know, in a lot of our cities, especially those that were bombed to fuck by the Germans, or had a lot of heavy industry which has since ended, things like this were built in their place. Horrid concrete monstrosities for the shops, also known as shopping malls. However, this one in Milton Keynes is surrounded by possibly the most extensive, never-ending stream of bargain I've ever seen. It's still one of the largest malls in the country to this day, which means I just kept getting lost in there. I don't like the mall. They also tried to give it this, like, faux Mediterranean resort feel with these palm trees, but they weren't fooling anyone. However, they still installed a market in the city centre, but who in their right mind wants to shop under the highway? It just reminded me of the episode of Spongebob, where they build this massive busy highway that goes right over the top of the Krusty Krab, so all Spongebob and Mr. Krabs can hear all day is traffic. Remember, the eternal MK truth. You're never more than five metres from the highway. The craziest thing I found out in a book celebrating the 50th year of Milton Keynes was the super pie in the sky plan for something called the City Club, with the most wacky and pointless features, but alas, it never got built. What got built instead was a giant woodhouse. With Milton Keynes being more or less built from scratch, it did mean that within the city centre they could build these pretty futuristic 
wacky, rare things like a ginormous indoor ski slope behind me now. This is Xscape. I'm pretty sure this opened with the city centre and it is built within the city centre and it's all prominent swathes of parking. And then come 2021 and the first building to fall victim to breaking the three-storey rule was built when this hideous 14-storey hotel opened, sticking out like a sore thumb above Campbell Park. Yet despite this and their really high ambitions for population, they didn't build a hospital, like a vital health facility, until the 80s. So much for the town of the future putting basic human needs first. The main thing MK boasts is supposedly being the greenest city in the UK. This is most noticed along the canal itself, which was responsible for me retaining my sanity while being moored here especially at the point between the aforementioned Campbell Park and the artificial flood prevention measure of Willen Lake. Atop the hill in Campbell Park, past this pyramid thing, you get an amazing view down into the valley, into Bedfordshire. The park also hosts the city's cricket ground, a rather misplaced totem pole, and this circular calendar thing with the columns mentioning most celebration days of the year, some well known, some not so, and some kind of like, why is this a day? This is one of the many circular things across the city that has these conspiracy theories that the whole entire thing was designed by the Illuminati, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was. The whole place just feels so contrived and artificial, I would not be surprised if it was weirded up by Beyonce. And then there's Willen Lake, where there isn't just water sports and park run, there's also a ginormous pagoda, the first and probably still the biggest in the western world. There's also this kind of irritating labyrinth all around me here, because I'm at the tree that is the goal, the end of the maze. Anyway, I did this last time we were here, but I did it backwards because I could not be asked to do it forwards. And between the two is a tree cathedral, similar to the one in Whipsnade, which I visited a few months back whilst doing the Inkneed Way. Designed by Neil Higson, all these trees are laid out in the layout of Norwich Cathedral. They even include sections to symbolise a transit, a cloister, and a little man made mound. The planners also saw a need to create a sense of community within each grid square and one of the ways they did this was through public art initiatives which has the concrete cows as its most famous product. This one's face seems to have slightly morphed into its uh, neck and front, left, shoulders, I mean is that a shoulder? It's a leg so surely like it's a hip. And behind me, we once again have concrete livestock. This is a replica of the concrete cows in the museum. The museum ones are the OGCZs. They were made with the inauguration of the city. And then these ones, the originals were put here. But then, because they were getting a bit old, they moved them to the museum because it's a bit quieter. You haven't got this bloody the highway. And these were put in its place, so there were still concrete cows in the location, I guess. Surprisingly, the art gets weirder as you go through Campbell Park. You've got this weird bunker thing and these metal figurines, I think, trying to do the human tower pyramid thing they make in Catalonia. More recently, there's the Japanese art trail that was put together along the canal, showcasing this lovely bench, a collage, a dragonfly, and my favourite, the frog. What about the places in this area that were already here before MK was established? Beyond the three towns, there were around a dozen villages nestled among the proposed site comprising a population already of about 50,000. Of these were Rawton with its green, Bradwell with its windmill, Orton with its church and Milton Keynes. You heard me right, Milton Keynes 
because while well, the city of Milton Keynes didn't exist 50 years ago, a Milton Keynes did. And it's here, in the east side of the town. And before the 60s, this place said it was absolutely tiny, it barely had 100 houses. And just to think, up until very recently, you could stand in places like this and you wouldn't be able to constantly hear the highway. When the original residents of these villages heard of the plans for Milton Keynes City, they were not happy about it. That's because many of the residents of these former villages to be eaten up were farmers who not only didn't want to live in a city, but would be having their land confiscated in order to build it. I found maps from across the years at the library and you can slowly see the original villagers being eaten up by the development of the new city. There was also a small village at the top of Willen Lake. And this is Willen, along with the church just there and a few more cottages back behind those cars and trees. This was just a tiny hamlet before the 70s that it got gobbled up by Milton Keynes. But my favourite had to be the abandoned Stantonbury with its small chapel, which a hundred years ago had to be reused despite being in ruins because the newer church in more populated Bradwell wasn't licensed for marriages. This one ceased to exist before Milton Keynes came into existence by quite a few hundred years. This is the old former grounds of Stantonbury, which now gives its name to a neighbourhood I'd say two, three kilometers south of here. And all that remains is this little church. Despite the village not lasting for very long, that didn't stop the high sheriff of Hertfordshire during the 1600s building a manor house here. It was supposedly built there just to my right with landscape gardens to my left and this mound sticking out the front, which I'm standing on top of. But alas, that didn't last long either, much less time than the village itself. It only lasted 75 years before it burnt down and then had to be demolished. It's the only one where you can't see any trace of the new city at all. Even in Rawton, if you are stood in the sheep field, if you look over, you can see Xscape. In the distance, it looks like a hill, but it's Xscape. And settlement goes back to the Romans. Remember I mentioned that first century road, Watling Street? Well, it was of course built by the Romans, just like this. This is Bancroft Villa, only about a kilometre east of said road. And Finney Stratford. Industry also thrived in the valley pre-Milton Keynes days. These brick kilns are reconstructions of ones that were on the exact same site over 150 years ago. This was a huge industry in the region during the early industrial boom. And 100 years on, the fire of ingenuity kept going. Bletchley, now considered a mere constituent town of Milton Keynes, is considered the birthplace of modern computing as it is where one of our greatest national heroes, Alan Turing, invented the bomb machine used to crack the Enigma code made by the Germans for secret message sending. And a reconstruction of his invention and other IT machinery are on display at the Computing Museum here. Now, you may write Milton Keynes off as a freak of nature or a that rejection of nature and a freak of supposed progress. And whilst I have a lot of resonance with that line of thinking, I still found beauty in the place. But there's many parks, original villages that got swallowed up, there are old churches, I'm walking along the canal and around Willen Lake. Even in the city centre, I found serene among the constant sound of traffic. You've got where the old Setlo 100 meeting ground used to be and a pretty unique war memorial considering the town was built well after both world wars. Some good old fashioned English heritage. Then there's the residents. They're so proud 
of their city and how unique it is because no matter how you frame it it's one of a kind it's not even like other new towns whether it's calculating distance in roundabouts having cycle paths everywhere and parks everywhere or just that itself was planned it's new i've got a mate who lives in milton Keynes, and he's proud of the fact of how efficient it is and there's no traffic and you easily get where you need to go it just works it's functional but i think that's the crux of it it's all just functional it works that's all it is the whole ethos of the planning of this city was to just meet needs as what the book says but a certain level of planning is required for every town to avoid like a shanty town developing i feel the more that is planned and ironed out and exactly calculated the more mundane and less intriguing your life becomes in milton Keynes, you'll drive or cycle everywhere and only pass trees until entering the specific grid square you need to go to you park up either you go to work surrounded by only offices or industrial units or if you go to the mall surrounded by only chain stores then you head home going along the same trees to get there the whole city is zoned, so every single area is either houses or factories or shops, and none of it overlaps. The closest you'll get is a few shops on the corner of a roundabout that lead on to some houses. And because everything is so spaced out, there's very little walking around the town. Even in the city centre, it's mostly cars and cycling. And the thing is on a human scale, and I think that is what's crushing any sort of spontaneity and originality in the city. I remember finding what I thought was quite a sad example of this. In Milton Keynes, there is one area in the city centre that's like an outdoor shopping area. Very common in old cities here in the UK, but when you've got this ginormous mall that's all indoors, not going to be that popular <laughs> just around the corner in Milton Keynes. And as expected, tons of chain restaurants, and then there was this one, one unique restaurant, not because of their food, but because of their waiting staff, in that they didn't have any, it was all robots. However, this place had closed down before we'd even made it to Milton Keynes. This only lasted two years in business before they went under. And I don't think that's to do with the concept, I think it's to do with the concept of Milton Keynes as a city. It's so, <laughs> like the restaurant, robotic and predictable. There's no room for individuality. But I think if this restaurant was reopened in, say, York, a city famous for its historic features and charm and layout, they would be turning over stacks because you're drawn to go to York already because it's so quirky and historic and then suddenly you've got this really futuristic quirk in the historic city centre you're drawn to I guess that contrast it would make you want to go there but Milton Keynes are so heavily planned I mean it's a tourist attraction if you're into terrible town planning but no one really chooses to go to Milton Keynes beyond anything functional it really shows that the futuristic restaurant couldn't last two years in what was the futuristic city of the 70s. Also in this slightly failed outdoor shopping area is the city gallery and quite ironically while I was there, well I think it's ironic, they had an exhibition about New York photographer Sol Leiter. While he did some paid professional work for magazine covers in the 60s, these were never his favourite photos. He did them because he had talent and he would get paid for them and he knew he was good at his job but what he most enjoyed was taking pictures of everyday life in New York's East Village where he lived he would take pictures of random things like people crossing the road and getting coffee and standing at the subway stop and I saw this as a real dichotomy between Milton Keynes sort of representing his corporate work and not just historic cities but general life in his just normal everyday photos that he was more proud of. Or maybe I'm just being a little too sentimental or whatever, and all Milton Keynes really needs to be the best city it can is a tram!
Before I sign off, I would like to firstly thank the Milton Keynes Library for keeping records of maps of the city all the way from 79 to now. It was a fantastic help in me figuring out what parts of the city were constructed in what sequence and when certain villages were gobbled up and how they were so and how the city was replanned around them. I'd also like to thank the Milton Keynes Museum and their Milton Keynes Modern City exhibit, I think it was called, was really good for my research and the founding of Milton Keynes. And I would also like to thank a YouTuber much bigger than me called Jimmy the Giant, who made a video about Milton Keynes a week or so ago. And not only were, did it give me a lot of inspiration for making this video, I started planning this quite a while before he released the video, but it was not only some good inspiration and ideas for how to frame the video, but also a bit of a kick up the backside for me to make this video. All that's left for me to say is, if you want to see more of the places I stop at as we go further south in the boat, or you're into trains, stick around. I've been Jack the Intrepid Train Traveller, and I'll see you in the next one.